Hi, it's Doug Lyon again, media lecturer being wheeled out for yet another interview about something else. Um, how would I define porn? I don't know, that is a difficult question I think these days. I think, I think it's quite a subjective thing. So, um, I think we live in very desensitised times. Um, I think you can have war footage that's pornography. I think you can have stuff that's on the tea time news that's like dead bodies being carted around that's pornography. I, I don't know how that became normal and okay to show like that. <clears throat> I think... Um, I think there's a sort of literal sense of what pornography is that, you know, had a kind of clear delineation in the olden days between erotica, softcore and hardcore. And usually that, you know, hardcore, the hardcore line is usually it involves an erect penis, isn't it? That's basically what was the line before. I don't know if, I don't know if that's the line anymore. And, um... You know, it used to be the case that, you know, when I when I was a lad, it, it you know it was very difficult for anybody to get hold of anything, and if you even a, even an adult an adult film, not even a a sexual film, one with an X certificate, you know, in those days it was an X certificate, would be something that you know maybe your mate had kind of nicked off his dad's film shelf and smuggled it round, and you know you had a sort of opportunity to watch some. It's a film that didn't have very much going on in it, but it was an X film, and that was kind of very naughty and kind of involved a lot of effort. But I think the good thing about that, and this is talking like an old person, was you did know, you knew you were doing something that you weren't really supposed to do, and of course that made it attractive, but you did also understand that there might be a consequence of watching something that you weren't really supposed to be getting. So do you think there is a consequence? I do because I think I think the consequence of of watching anything is that you you can't take it back out of your head once it's in. And my um, my worst example of porn is nothing to do with sexuality at all. And and it, and it was my mate who his mate waved a mobile phone at him in the pub and said, "Have a look at this." And it was a five-second clip of a, an actual beheading. And he watched it and he just went, what the fuck did you show me that for? And it was just one of those, he didn't even know what he was being shown. He watched it and he said, I just felt different. I, I felt, from that point onwards, I felt different. I'd seen something that I didn't want to see. Can't take that image out of your head. And I think, I think that is a problem. I don't think, I mean, you know, when you've got seven or eight-year-old lads with a mobile phone in the playground that they've got access to pretty much anything in the world, I do think that is a problem. So, for me, the whole pornography debate is very much about context and access. And I, and I don't think... I think, by and large, probably 90% of what is produced for adults for consenting... You know, with consenting adults for consenting adults... 18 might be a bit of an arbitrary age, but as a guideline, I think it's quite a good one because I don't think eight-year-old lads are meant to be watching stuff, anything what like that. Should be. I don't know, really. I think probably there's a debate you can have around sort of 14, 16, 18, and I think that varies from country to country. I think gradually sexuality has slipped backwards age-wise. I mean, I think Spain's age of consent is 14, isn't it? And, you know, different countries have a different approach to it. It's probably different in Scandinavia. But I, I really don't think that eight-year-old lads should be watching hardcore porn. I think that is really... I think it's the same thing as smoking super skunk. It's like it does something different to your brain at that stage. Your brain's not meant to get that. You know, we do... If you look at child psychology or anything like that, we are designed, like any other animal, to kind of open up at certain stages. Just going off on one too much. Um, why do you think that um, pornography is illegal at 18, but 
to actually take part in sexual intercourse, it's 16. Well, look, the, all these sort of legal things are all a bit arbitrary, aren't they? I mean, if you go back, I don't know, if you go back 200 years, a, a woman was a woman when they had their period, that was the deciding thing, and a, and a bloke was marriageable if he had a dowry and had something to offer financially. So you don't have to go back that long to find a time when middle-aged blokes were marrying young girls and that was considered perfectly normal. Um, Victorians did a lot of things around legality that were all a bit kind of reactionary. And I don't personally think we've come back very far from the Victorian times. I think we'd like to think we're very liberal and uh, free, but I'm not convinced at all so far. I mean, certainly if you go to Denmark or Holland or Sweden or other places that really are decades ahead of us, you sort of realise how behind the times we are, I think. What, in your opinion, separates the porn industry as an industry compared to other industries? Well, it's, and that's another hard question, isn't it, at the moment, around in, what is the industry, because so much of what is available now is made seemingly by amateurs who decide that they want to share something very intimate in a public domain. Well, that's not an industry, is it? Unless it is then bought by a server who then try and make somebody pay for it and, and industrialise it. I think, you know, it's like the music industry. What's the music industry now? If you go home, make an album in your bedroom and release it on SoundCloud, have you released an album? Is that industry or is that just Joe Bloggs doing their thing and it's public domain? I mean, I, I don't really know. I don't really know what the answer to that question is anymore. I think, I think what, you, what the industry used to be was very straightforward, which was an, there was an adult industry that was like the film and TV industry, except the content was different, and they had their own world and their own rules and their own awards and all that kind of stuff, and that was quite straightforward. But I don't think it, it is straightforward anymore. I think it's really complicated now. When I said porn industry, you instantly mind. Um why do you reckon you instantly jumped to thinking about uploading, people uploading free materials online rather than the companies producing DVDs? Well, I think it's, it, it's like uh, the same thing that came up in uh, an interview that I was looking at from last year's practice-based dissertations where a music journalist, John Robb, says nobody under 20 is ever going to pay for music anymore. It's just gone. That time's gone. So... I think this, I think it's the same with the porn industry. I think I don't know about this. I don't know what the statistics are, but my guess is it's very difficult to get anybody to pay for anything anymore. Because why would you? Because there's so much that you don't have to pay for. So what the music industry's had to do is shift the goalposts, and instead of trying to get a band to make a record that gets into the charts, that's played on the radio, that people go and buy, that makes them money, now they want a couple of artists on their roster to make an advertising commercial soundtrack that then pays for 10 bands to make an album on that label. But the money's going to come back from a commercial soundtrack or it's going to come from the band's touring. So everything shifts around, doesn't it? I mean, I know more about the music industry and what I can say the music industry in this country now, the la live music is better than it's been for decades because everybody's playing again. But that's because they don't know how to make any money out of anything else. So I don't really know what the consequences are for the porn industry. If you, if you do something that costs money to make and you can't make money back from selling it, well, what, what do you do? I mean, that's, that's a whole new zone, isn't it, for an industry? Previously, we've had a manufacturing industry that is, you know, you make a car, you sell it. You make a film, you sell it. If you make something that costs a lot of money to make and you can't sell it, what's that about? So the internet's definitely had an influence on the porn industry in as much as people can upload online. Um, but do you think the porn industry has had an influence on the internet? Well, porn's led the way on the internet because it's, it's 
it's led the way with technology. It, it was it was the it was the first industry. Even before the internet, it was the first industry that realised that you could stick a, a cassette on the end of a phone line and get somebody to dial an 0898 number and pay pound fifty an hour to hear somebody go, ooh, ah, ooh, ah. I mean, that was genius. Nobody had come up with that idea outside of the porn industry. And then, you know, pay-per-view and all that kind of thing, I guess that kind of bled into um, Sky or other, cha sort of other channels that weren't like that. But... I mean, even now on the Freeview box, or, or there's still channels that you have to pay for. But I do really wonder, do, does anybody? They, I guess they must do, otherwise they wouldn't exist. But that just seems like a model that's gone now. Often when people have done research, such as Georgina Navos, one of the lecturers in uh, Brighton University, she's discovered that there's a lot of negative press around the porn industry as an industry. Um, do you believe this will ever change? Why do you think this negative perception is there? Well, because it's an exploitative industry traditionally, that's the main reason. I mean, you know, the film industry is an exploitative industry, TV industry is. The porn industry is just worse because people are doing something that is much more intimate and affects their psyche more. But I don't think, I think it's quite a fine line. I mean, I think the film industry has always been like that. I think women's place in the media has always been pretty demeaning for female actresses, even outside of the porn arena. I mean, I don't really think that's, I mean, the Bechdel test, have you seen that video that I posted for you? It's amazing, right? This woman, feminist, woman has done this Bechdel test and the test is you run it on um, any film if a woman speaks to another woman for more than a minute about anything other than a bloke the film passes the test if they don't the film doesn't pass the test guess what most of the Oscar nominated films don't pass the Bechdel test and that's today that women's place is that kind of marginalized within mainstream Hollywood films that they don't even have a life outside of talking to each other at all about anything other than blokes. So we're not really just talking about the porn industry here, we're talking about the media industry and representations as a whole. Do I think they're worse in porn? Well, not really, because in actual fact, I think, I think male, male characters in porn are probably more fetishised and more demeaned in some ways as just kind of performing pricks than the women are. But I mean, I think that's a whole other argument that doesn't tend to come out of feminism, that the bloke's role in porn really is pretty awful. Um, so do you think pornography is degrading for women? Well, I think it's degrading, generally. I think it's pretty rare that there's any kind of decent production standards. I mean, you get, you know, you kind of get the you know, whatever, the sort of playboy end of things, which is kind of very soft-core, airbrushed, kind of pulsing about with nice lighting and stuff. But it's still awful, isn't it? I mean, it's awful. Any attempt at any plot line is always awful. It's always embarrassing. It's, it, it, it's, it's reductionist because ultimately it's, it's functional, functional media for a bloke to get off on. And in the same way that... I mean, this is a dangerous ground, really, on, on camera saying this. But I remember a, a gay friend of mine saying, telling me about Hampstead Heath. And he was saying, on an average night in Hampstead Heath, I've got a choice of about a 1,000 blokes. And I can wander about. If I like the look of somebody, we wander into a bush, have a bit of a fiddle. If I don't like them, I just walk off. I haven't had a conversation. I was like, wow, that's amazing. Like, that's a whole other world that I didn't know about. But in a way, that says something about bloke sexuality. It's like, we don't really need a conversation. We don't really, I mean, this is terribly stereotypical, but I do think that bloke sexuality has been very stereotyped, and what blokes want from functional erotic material is, yeah, just don't bother with the plot line, don't need that. Whatever that is, is a kind of spurious attempt to create a minor bit of narrative but it's silly. I mean, I think the best thing about porn, actually, is the names of films and the, and the actors. I mean, that's hilarious. 
there's a whole humour side to it that isn't picked up on that says a little bit about the less serious side of it. But it's just all very silly and grubby and terrible, isn't it, most of it? Well, um, uh, Alison Vivas, the CEO of Pink Visual, Pink Visual is a porn production company which is described as quite an innovative one. Um, she came seventh in the list of top women in male dominated industries on the website Big Think. She detailed that porn has changed from the outdated stereotypical view uh, that many have, such as the traditional one you're talking about. So it, is, it is simply false to assert that all pornography portrays women as objects of sexual desire. What, do you, what are your opinions on what she said there? Do you reckon that um, the role of women in pornography uh, is changing or is it possible that it can change? I don't know, I've not seen any evidence for that. I mean, isn't the, pretty much the basic nature of most pornography that women are the objects of desire and blokes are usually fairly predatory and just kind of wanting to get their thing sorted out? Isn't that kind of the basis of most of it? I mean, I don't know what you're proposing as a different model here because I, I don't know about it. There was a study done recently in by... Uh, I think it was the sun. It took 1,200 people, and 70% of the women who were interviewed said that they watched pornography, and 80% said they'd watched pornography with a partner. Yeah, but you've got to look at your sources, man. I mean, that's from the sun. I know, I know, but. Um, I mean, if that was a Guardian uh, survey, or, you know, it'd been done by Newsnight, or somebody with a little bit of anything behind them. I mean, yeah, the sun. Sun's toilet paper. The sun did, the, uh, did the study. I think the Sun published the study. I'll get that out for you if you were interested in looking at that. So, you, you see, there's a big difference between just because something becomes normalised doesn't mean it's better or okay. It just means that people have got used to it. This is hegemony. You know, the pornification of media you know, if you look at the vast majority of female presenters on TV now, they look like porn stars. It's become normal, you know, whether it's Strictly Come Dancing or X Factor or anything. It has bled into the mainstream. There's a look that's become normalised. Oh, look at that fucking horrible Take Me Out programme. There's a whole row of girlies looking like porn stars because they've learned that that's what you're meant to look like to be attractive. I mean, I'm not a fan of that. I just think that's, that's like the Barbie stereotype Mark III, isn't it? It's just a, a look that people have decided. I mean, you look at it on Facebook, everybody looks the same now. All of our girlies, you know, they, they've all learned how to do the slightly sideways thing with the tits out and do that and, 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 and do all that stupid stuff. I mean, it's like, why, why has that become normal? It's not because it's good. Do you think that's a massive generalisation? Well, look at, you look at all your friends on Facebook. Look at their profile pictures. It's a sea of sameness. OK, how about... Um, what do you reckon has led to this um, uh, hegemonisation? Or... We're being programmed. You know, TV programmes, the clues in the title, programmes. We get programmed by things. Advertising. People don't think advertising works. They don't think when they walk down the aisle to buy their tin of beans or their can of lager, that they're buying something because they've been programmed to do that. They just think, oh, I've got free choice. I'll buy the lager that I want. I just really like Stella. I, I'd hazard a guess that most people blind tested wouldn't have a clue the difference between things. They're just that you are programmed and we're susceptible to suggestion. And then we forget and we think we've got free choice, but the clue is looking at the advertising industry because that's where the money is in the media industry. And if it didn't work, they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't spend all that money on it. And I think it's the same with everything. You, you, human beings, animals, and human beings are animals to a certain extent, learn by repetition. So if you do the same thing a lot, you watch the same thing a lot, it does become normalised. You do learn that that's just the way that it is. Michel Foucault said that uh, gender was a socially, culturally created concept and is argued by um, uh, Nina Hartley, who's a uh, speaker for the National Organisation of Women and she also happens to be, uh, she used to be a porn actress. Um, she argued that these kind of concepts of gender are 
uh, deconstructed by uh, contemporary porn, like this n like new wave of porn, which is expressing uh, emotion from the women. Um, do you think that looking at porn can be used to educate society, or? But not really, because it's like. There's, there's one word you can add to two words that are generally quite interesting to a lot of people. Sex and drugs. Interest levels generally go up. You add the word education to those words, interest levels generally go down. Sex education traditionally has been awful in education, in, in almost all media, apart from the sex education show, which I think is great. That's probably the only thing I've ever seen that I think, bloody hell, I wish I'd seen that when I was 12. I wish somebody had shown me that. I might have had a clue what was going on in the world. But look at the sex education show, it stances the sex education show versus pornography. Because pornography is adult entertainment that is devised to kind of blow things up and caricature it in a certain way for a particular reason. It's not trying to tell the truth. So, so what, why, why, why would you learn anything genuinely educational from that? That's like saying... Um, what would it be like saying? I don't know. I think about computer games a bit, like in that, you know, what what do people get out of doing endlessly playing World of Warcraft or like running around shooting things? Is that useful anger management? Is it uh, improving kind of motor skills and coordination? Or is it learning a sort of desensitised set of kind of whatever? I mean, I don't, I don't really know. I think it's a very fine line, and I think a lot of that also depends on context. You know, if it's an eight-year-old lad compared to an 18-year-old lad, if it's somebody who might have mental health issues or might not, do you know there's a lot of... Things get very broad-brushed, don't they? And I think it's more complicated than that. Um, but I don't think anything that I've ever seen or been told about or heard about so far in what I would consider the porn world is in any way educational. No, I don't. Um, I remain to be convinced. Uh, so do you think it's possible to be a feminist and a pornographer, a producer or porn actress? Well, you know, this is another classic, classic complex thing, isn't it? Once you get into what they call post-feminism or third wave of feminism, where women, certain women are saying, I am not being objectified, I am choosing to be subjectified. If this is what I choose to do with myself and I'm making money out of it, what's your problem? Well, there is a problem because, again, things have become normalised to a point where, you know, if that, if that was one aspect of what was going on and women in Hollywood films were getting great equal roles and getting great equal pay and other things were evened out, it wouldn't be so much of an issue, but the, the problem is that it isn't okay in a, almost any aspect of the media industry. And, the, and what you're looking at is a particular slice of it, which is just a bit more extreme, or a lot more extreme, depending on how you look at it. Um, so... Um, do you think it is possible for women to be represented correctly, or is, do you think it's possible to represent sex correctly? As it, it's been argued that in gay and lesbian porn, and it, there are awards for feminist porn in which women are represented, well, ideally. You see, I think it's really complicated. I think, I think traditionally female sexuality and traditionally male sexuality is really different. So take, for example, a bit of a personal development cliche like women will have sex with men out of feeling close to them. Men will have sex with women out of wanting to feel closer to them. So when you start looking at things like that, that's, I mean, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's like, that's a slightly different angle on it, isn't it? Women will have women out of wanting a relationship with men will sometimes have sex with them. 
men out of wanting sex with a woman will sometimes have a relationship with women. I mean, that's a sort of silly stereotype cliche, but just as even a different angle on things, it's like, right, so if... I mean, okay, 90 bloody shades of whatever big thing at the moment, isn't it? I think that's really diff... I think it's really different when you put something into literature because that's leaving a space for your imagination to do its own thing. <coughs> I think... <coughs> Sorry, Luke. <coughs> Can we read? <coughs> Sorry, right. I think um, if you're reading something or if you're just listening to it, that's very different to if you're watching it. So I, I, th I think that's a clear delineation. Now, the th uh, is it possible to be a feminist and a pornographer? Well, <coughs> is Jenna Jameson a feminist? I don't think she would probably claim to be one. She's kind of probably the best known example of a woman who's ma allegedly made it in a man's world, made herself a millionaire ass doing what she's doing, and she says, I enjoy it, so why shouldn't I do that or the other? But then she's also got a, a horribly abu abused past, and I think... You can't take away from the fact that, you know, statistically, and I don't know whether this is true or not because I haven't looked into the statistics, abuse does run very strongly in the porn industry. People who are in it have abuse pasts. So that's not very healthy, replaying out that, for, to my mind. Have you heard of... Um I suppose actually this is part of it as well. You've heard of Cindy Gallup, we've mentioned her before. Yeah, you're brightened. She's website, Make Love Not Porn, in which is a social network where people can share uh, intimate porn relation, intimate relationships they have with their partners online uh, as a way of representing real sex to a wide audience. Yeah, but it's not real. Real? Well, no, this is, the, this is the fascinating thing, isn't it? What is real? If you... Right, have you ever have you got into quantum physics at all? Partially. Quantum physics says that observing something, looking at that table physically alters the structure of the thing that you're looking at just by you observing it. I mean, that, that is the cutting edge of where science is at the moment. That's quite a mind-blowing concept. You look at that cupboard and it is physically altered by your perception. I don't really know what I think about that. It's a bit of a mind-blowing thing. But I do think there is something about you observe something, you make it different. What, whatever real sex is, it didn't have a camera there and it wasn't broadcasting to the world what somebody was doing in the privacy of their own space. That's a very recent thing and, and that is like reality TV to me. Reality TV is, oh, hang on a second, you're on a TV set with 50 cameras. What's real about that? It's a performance. So you don't think it's possible to capture real sex? Well, <clears throat> you know, you could say, all right, but what if you put a secret camera in a room and record somebody and they didn't know, so they weren't performing, and then you release that onto the net? Is that real sex? I mean, that's kind of, well, it's not your sex tape stuff, because that's a different thing, isn't it? When, as soon as somebody knows there's a camera there, they're performing. So you could argue that the only thing that could be, con I could argue, the only thing that could be considered real sex, whatever that is, is if somebody put a camera there that people didn't know it was there, and then it became public domain. But then by the nature of it becoming public domain, it's recontextualised and it isn't the same thing anymore. It isn't two people sharing, or however many people sharing whatever they were sharing. It's become a media discourse. It's become something about power. It's become something about voyeurism. You know, it's, it's got a context. It's on a website. It's next to dogs and donkeys and whatever. I mean, it's, you know, nothing is a, is a neutral, is it? You could argue that. What do you think these online communities are, what effect they're having on the industry? I've no idea. I don't really know anything about that, but I, what I do know a little bit about from last year's student work is the effect that um, Grinder and things like that are having on things. So 
with Grinder, where you've got online dating mixed with real life convergence technology around Bluetooth and um, GPRS. I mean, if once you, st I mean, that is the way things are going to go. That technology has been invented. It's being used for that way, and it will carry on doing that now. And it is bleeding more into the heterosexual scene now. The gay scene picked it up very quickly. So, on the surface, that looked like quite a good thing. You know, if you, if you're a cruising gay bloke, and rather than having to kind of find somebody through a set of behaviours that could be a bit risky, you can now do it from your sofa in the comfort of your own home watching EastEnders. That seems like quite a good idea. And that's something to do with real sex, whatever real is, and making it safer and increasing options and choice. But then, quite quickly, what's happened is that the gay clubs are starting to go, we're not getting our customers anymore because that's where people had to go to cruise and now they don't have to do that. And so suddenly a real life community of face-to-faceness is starting to dissolve away. Well, that wasn't the intention of that technology. So, I don't know, that, that concerns me. So I think the, th the trouble is we invent things and we don't really know where they're going to go. I don't know if that was the answer to what you asked me. Yeah, that was it. It's not necessarily the correct, like, it's not like a direct answer. It's just... Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, if, if what people are doing is between consenting adults and it's being consumed by consenting adults, then in theory that's all relatively straightforward. But I don't think things are relatively straightforward. I think they're much more complicated than people think they are. Okay, finally, what do you think lies in the future for porn in relation to the industry and the internet or its well, you know, expectations a bit? One of the definite futures of pornography is going to be interactive convergence technology and um, sensory suits and all that thing. I mean, it's inevitable, isn't it? To be able to put on a something that kind of responds to touch from somebody somewhere else and all that kind of thing. I mean... They thought that was going to happen in the 80s when we put on these big crash helmets and wandered around on a pixelated chessboard with a drumstick pointing around going, wow, virtual reality. Yeah, it was definitely virtual. It wasn't anything to do with reality. Lawnmower Man, you know, I mean, when they made Lawnmower Man, awful film. But, you know, at the time it did really seem like, oh, that's just around the corner. Well, it, it hasn't arrived yet, I would imagine. I mean, I watched a programme last night about um, architecture and cities and it was looking at Tokyo and Shanghai and some of these cities that have just shot up. There's like, there's a saying, in Tokyo now, there's a city the size of Chicago above the 14th floor. People living above the 14th floor, the size, city the size of Chicago, up that high. I mean, that's just mind-blowing. Like... What, are we designed to do that? That's, that's like a whole other stage of evolution that I don't really know what the consequence of that is, but I would imagine people don't know their neighbours, that sense of community that people used to have is dislocated and there's something quite weird and a bit disorientating about living 20 floors up all the time and your kids' playgrounds on the 14th floor, not on the ground floor, all that kind of stuff is... We don't really know what any of this stuff's doing. We don't really even know what mobile phones are doing to us. It's, we don't, you know, af after the initial kind of, oh, we're frying our brain stuff, everybody's kind of forgotten that one now. I don't know where the research went on that, but I think we're delicate human beings, and I think we very easily chuck a lot of stuff at ourselves that we don't really know what the consequence of it is. So I'm not um, a puritanical kind of moral liner about pornography, but I think there are consequences to putting stuff in our heads that you can't take out. You can't take it back out once it's in. And I think for that reason alone, I don't know what the solution is, because I don't think you can filter it anymore. I don't think you can technically filter it. I don't think you can legally filter it. But I would like 
an eight-year-old lad to be able to filter it themselves. I'd like them to know that they've got a choice in the playground on their smartphone whether to look at that or not and be able to go, actually, I don't think I do want to look at that. So do you think they don't have a choice now? I don't think people know how to self-monitor or filter things very well now. Most people don't even know the difference between private and public anymore. The amount of stuff I see on Facebook of people just... Why are, you, why are you making your discussion public? Why don't you talk to each other? Why, why, do you, why have you broadcast this ridiculous, intimate conversation about something that's clearly between the two of you? Uh, that's an issue, I think, of our times. Like, uh, last thing, right? you said vanilla a couple of times in our meeting the other day. Yeah. So we've, no, we've now created this derogatory term for, I mean, it's used as a derogatory term in the fetish world for people who don't know any better. When you can have a hundred flavours of ice cream, why would you just have vanilla? That's where it came from. And what vanilla means is like, you know, just normal sex between two adults doing, doing that kind of boring thing when there's a whole world of other stuff out there. I mean, I think that's a bit fucked up, literally. So that's my part in common is... Just because you have the choice doesn't mean that the choice is better. What, one last little thing from that. Why, what, why do you think that? I what, just think, what, do you, what do you reckon has led you to think that? Because I think we've been befuddled by marketing. We, you know, we don't want to go shopping and see lager on the shelf. We want to see an entire aisle of lager on the shelf to go, I want that one. Well, what I'm interested in is um, what has made you think that it's bad for us. These sex industry, film, television. <coughs> because it's just crept up and it's become normalised and it hasn't been... We jumped from a very mediated stage of, of media around the 80s and TV and film where there was a clear watershed. If you watch something after 11 o'clock at night, you might see a bit of something interesting in it, you know, but... You weren't going to before nine or ten at night because that was the watershed. In films, if you went to see a double A, oh, somebody might swear or you know somebody might get the tits out or something. But it was really clear, and then it's just kind of dissolved out into this world of anything that's there, anything's available. Think of a tune, you've got it. Think of a, whatever you fancy, you've seen it. I don't think that's I don't think that's smart. I don't think people are smart enough to know how to choose smartly. That's why I think it's a problem. It's not about the stuff. That's interesting. And I think that's the solution, is people need to be taught how to be smart, but there aren't teachers in the school system smart enough and on it enough now to know how to teach our kids. I mean, if you lot became teachers in three or four years' time after you've done all this, and you were teaching primary school kids, how would you teach them how to be he how to be aware of what they do with themselves and their choices? I'm sure in four years' time there'll be specific teachers for that. Well, I hope so. Don't see any evidence of that so far. They already are. In schools, they've got special uh, guest teachers that go around schools that teach kids about uh, the internet. And you know, I know this because one of my mates was on. He did um, work at university as an IT technician. All right. So we spoke to one of these, um, I think it's like a guest teacher, mm. like like a traditional kind of farmer or someone would go around different schools and they'd educate kids about uh, internet specifically because they've got it on their handhelds. Yeah, oh um, good. Um, do you reckon uh, what medium, what, um, what type of medium uh, is going to influence the sex industry or what is the sex, what, sex, what medium with the sex industry influence the most in the future? Well this is like, I've said to, to Nelda that she should talk to you and you should talk to her because her thing is about what is television. What is that now? Television used to be a box in the room, probably one in the living room with three or four channels on it that everybody sat and watched together and then you know everybody started to get a little black and white portable in their bedroom so they could watch their own thing and then it became a bigger thing and then it became you know catch up and all this that and the other and now you have a screen but 
you don't really know whether you're watching television or online anymore. That's starting to almost blur out. And then once you get into two screen where your handheld becomes a parallel device to the thing that you're watching on the main screen and things are produced for two screens. So your handheld could be a remote for what you're watching on the main screen, but it could be directors, commentaries, outtakes, or, you know, you started to watch two screens at once. I mean, it's, it's wild. But I generally, what happens with technology like that it doesn't make the content any better. People just get seduced by the more choice thing. Well, I think that's part of the problem in the first place. More choice usually just means more shite. There's an end quote for you.